Welcome back to our channel. Help us print our next issue by buying us a coffee. Thank you for supporting Archetype. Well, thank you again so much for taking the time to speak with us. And um, like Ali already said, your story is so beautiful. And I personally felt very connected to the main character, Min. So thank you for that. And just to learn a little bit more about you, uh, how would you describe your relationship with writing? And why do you love doing it? I will. Good. So I will turn so I don't ramble off. I'm going to look at a little bit of what I what I wrote here. And so thinking a lot about writers, you know, because that's who's going to watch these. So I write really intermittently um, because my work comes first and my work involves students. So it's sort of flesh and blood people come first. And then my characters who I love and share my heart with a bit um, for a while, they would come second. Um, but just like with this story is about work, I've been thinking a lot about work. I think we're all thinking about work. And so I want to just mention that for me, writing is play. Um, it's something I had to kind of, this is sort of more fresh for me, but in the past number of years, I want to, I want to frame it that way. And I want to think of um, how children are with play. It's very serious. It's not that it's not serious. And so I think another, you know, a draw for writing for me is it's really magical in the sense that in the space of the page, this elastic magical space, you know, time, we can leap between vast distances of time and space, just in a few words, in a sentence. Um, so that is a draw. Another draw is is that integration of inner and outer. So, so it's kind of integrating time, uh, it's integrating inner and outer. All of that is a process of coming to clarity, you know, integration and clarity. So there's that. And then the last thing I'll say is just for fiction, because I do like writing in, in all the genres, but for fiction, I love that it's, it feels like dreaming. It just feels like dreaming a bit to me. And it also, you know, poetry's attention and connection. And, but, but fiction, one of the requirements really is that empathetic imagination. So that leaning out, poetry has that, you know, Keats's clumsy negative capability. <laughs> I hate that word, but, but that idea of just opening, opening out of yourself and opening like a window. And I, but with fiction, it's it's got this empathetic imagination that I think is just beautiful, and we need more and more and more. We need so much more of it. In my lifetime, and my lifetime has been very short, I should say. I'm in my early twenties, but um, just interacting with writers, I feel like writers can be very self-critical sometimes, and the writing process becomes very difficult because you write and you you think, oh, it doesn't sound right or what would this person think about that? And I really liked what you said about um, writing as a form of play and for you. And I, I just wanted to ask, like, do you feel like that um, relationship with writing has freed you a little bit from maybe the criticism that you've experienced? That is, that is like, we're thinking alike, yes. One of your last questions I put, um, I, I put three things and, and one was play. So I brought up play again. If we make it play, um, so we can procrastinate and we can kind of get tense when we do hard things. And we can procrastinate and get tense when we do things we care about. And I feel like writing is one of those things that, you know, we both care about it and it can be hard, you know? So I feel like by making it play, you know, we can, we can kind of just, well, it's that whole realm of, of opening it up to allow mistakes, like learning we make mistakes, you know, like all of that kind of stuff can go on where we're not as tight and tense. And um, it can become like more, and this is clunky and I'm sorry, but like active rest or, you know, it's just sort of, I, I've been thinking a lot about rest because we don't rest, you know, and my story even is about this a lot, right? We're being worked to death, you know, it's been going on a long time. Um, so I think when we writers talk about writing as work, I mean, there's really good reasons for it. And some of it is society, things like, you know, they don't, you know, it's not as valued as much, you know, everything's money. So it's sort of, if we call it work, if we frame it as work, you know, maybe they'll leave us alone and let, and let us do it more. But so, but I'm thinking that relationship of, of having it be play, it just sort of tones down that doubt you're talking about and that picking at yourself more and there's just freedom to, to be a little messier. And can you tell us a little bit about your story, Miracle Supply Company, and how that idea came about? So this one is funny and like, I'll talk more, you'll probably ask me later about, you know, what it's part of, but this one's pretty much auto fiction. And I teach a class that we look at sort of, we look at stuff that, um, you know, we read a bunch of things, um, including Neil Gaiman's Ocean at the End of the Lane, which is magical. It's actually a magical, wonderful book. And we'll read Tim O'Brien's uh, book of Linked to Vietnam Stories. And we'll read 
um, Jolie Otsuka, we read a lot of fiction, but we're thinking about memoir. So I think about this a lot, but um, this piece is really auto fiction. It's, it really is practically memoir in a few places. The dreams are one. It's one of those things that we're told in like writing classes, like don't use, you know, and, and all of that don't do this just makes me like, a, you know, tell me not to put a heart in my poem. I'm going to find a way to say the word heart all over the poem, you know, or put it in the title or something. So, but with dreams, I mean, that's interesting too about dominant culture is sort of dreams are really important and we could spend all day on that. And, you know, dreams in older other cultures are places of learning and teaching and like a whole nother field of knowing and thinking. I think it's just really, it's really quite humorous to me that people would say, don't put a dream in fiction because it won't be believable or fiction and dreaming are so close. Why wouldn't we even start there? So this story did start with that seed of the dream. And we'll talk about that later. What I will say is her, her, her the kind of main struggle she's going through, the, the, the daytime one, not the nighttime one, but the daytime one is this workplace. And that is really similar <laughs> to my old job at my old university. And of course, names change, genders changed, the function of the office is, is changed. But the general mood of the place um, fits, the feelings of men were my feelings. What I'll say is that by writing this, it was very, it was cathartic the way memoir is cathartic. Like there was actual kind of, even though it's been years since I worked there, there was sort of closure more, <laughs> which is funny because the story opens out at the end, it sort of opens out. But the choice to make it fiction is two reasons, because I like to write in different genres. And one would be, um, I'm private. I'm actually quite private. So this is all very weird to be, you know, like I'm clearly not right now. And I shared with you and we had an intimate, you and I were together alone in Zoom, but I shared that the, the dream is mine from the five-year-old time, like from five years old, the war dream. And so, you know, though I didn't write it as memoir, because I thought it all sounds too weird. Here I am sharing what it is. And what it is, is I, I do think we're very porous. I, I My worldview is we're part of sort of an invisible web. Magic for me is quite real. And so I don't find it strange that a five-year-old would dream dreams of war. My father was in Vietnam, you know, one of America's other hostile, you know, we run around being hostile and aggressive and um, unjust uh, wars. But, you know, to have a, a young person home from war and a little kid, you know, in the next room, and why not? Why wouldn't that be a dream? So I dreamed it for decades. I dreamed it into my 30s. So that dream was my dream. And it's kind of the heart. It's sort of the, you know, we have the daytime struggle of men, but then at night we have this other thing going on that they're not paralleling, but they're both parts of the story. Um, so that's why it was fiction. And that is part of why men needed to be enemies. And I will stop there for, for now. Thank you for sharing. And Dreams are something that most people, they experience and then they forget about, you know, like we spend half our life sleeping and you just think what really happens during that half part of our life, like eight hours a day, you know, if we're getting the average amount, um, is it just nothing? Is it, you know, dreams that we forget? And so it's really like you used the word magical earlier, how you were having these visions of a place that, you know, you've never been to and it was reoccurring over the years. And I think that the power and the beauty of that really translated well in your story. So as you talked about um, just the series of stories you've been writing of men, can you tell us a little bit about um, yeah, the story, the, the series that you've been writing so far um, and the character that you've written about. Yes. Um, so Min is part of a linked collection I'm working on, and I am loving it so much. My um, my MFA was in poetry, so I love linking and leaping and echoes and returns. And um, I've written about, um, let me think, six stories, and five of them are like out. And then I've outlined, I think you were asking me, I've outlined two more. I have like 10 or 12 more in mind that have seeds. Like I sort of have the general character and the general thing going on. It's all happening really on a street. I was renting a house on for about five years. So it's like a working class St. Louis street. So it's kind of, you know, it's, it's rooted in the real, it's rooted in the real, you know, but it's totally mad, you know, it's, it's other than this auto fiction, fiction one. Um, but men's in a few of them because they're neighbors. So people are looking out for each other. You know, people are, are doing what people do who are neighbors. You know, they're, you know, someone's old and they're, bringing them canned whatever and there's feral cats and we're taking care of those and so it's um all of that's happening and all of the folks in the stories are um and I do want to say you know it's it's working class St. Louis neighborhood so there's all kinds of different races ethnicities ages backgrounds you know all of that's going on and then everyone there's a little bit of magic in all of them so everyone's having sort of these really you know little moments of illumination and release 
um, that's a big part of each each story has that happening. That's amazing. And it sounds like you're creating a universe almost of all these characters. Yeah, 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 yeah. And there's a lot of, I mean, I, I was, anyway, yeah, I love, there's a lot of love in it. Like, I love that. Like, they kind of love each other. You know, they're, it, it's just a, sometimes I don't know, but yeah, they're, 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 there's hard things, but there's a lot of love. And I think, I don't know, I think we need that. Absolutely. So. And can you describe to us the process of creating these characters and perhaps any challenges that you've experienced throughout the way? I was really, I'm just gonna be really, I'm quite vulnerable and honest. So with men, I was just really the whole time worried, <laughs> you know, pre-writing, you know, and pre-writing for me, I don't have any time at this point in my life to write very much. So pre-writing can be a really long process, but it was like, there is that whole characters who don't look like me and am I allowed to write the character and should I do it? And so, you know, spending months pre-writing and thinking about it. And then, um, you know, frankly, through the pre-writing, writing, revising, sending it out, you know, just kind of worrying about that, spending time in research, like a lot of time just thinking even really, and kind of overthinking, but sort of going, when, how old was Min when, when Min left Vietnam? Like what age was she? Where might she have gone to? Where were her grandparents living? You know, that she would be visiting her grandmother. Just thinking a lot about all of that, thinking back in life to a mentor of mine, who's Vietnamese, but would be older generations. So he would be a baby boomer. Um, so he's not men's age exactly, but just, so a lot of that went on and thinking about it. And then also just kind of, I do teach writing. And so it's sort of like that writing is play, learning is learning is um, mistakes. Like just kind of finally just going, this really does have to be this way. And I'm going to write possibly with mistakes. So and leaning a lot on Nisi Shaw's writing the other book. I always, I have a really old copy. I don't know if the, but the, the writing the other book's a really good book. And if you guys want to put a link to the um, website, it's just a website replete with like webinars and people thinking about writing characters that don't look like you or don't come from your background or characters with people that are um, differently abled. And like, you know, you're going to write a blind character. Well, why don't you find out more about that, that kind of stuff. So, but, but writing the other, I'll send you guys the link. And like, there's just a so much great stuff. The website's even better than the book at this point. Um, but that would be the challenges with the men character, much more than usual, you know, and um, other characters, it's very interesting. It's like, I think about others and then I, I've had a really long and wild and weird life. And so I just kind of go, sometimes I revisit old places in myself that really feel, you know, diff, you know, I just, so they're kind of, my characters are sort of amalgamated, but very alive to me. Like, I, I feel like the last thing I'll say is I feel like you share like their heart and mind and life. And like, you're kind of almost like, if you could take two trans, like there's me and I'm transparent and then there's the, and we kind of are like doing that for a while and we're walking together or something. It's, it's really, you know. That's kind of really interesting because I was just gonna ask, you know, what does research look like for fiction writing? You know, we think about scientific writing, perhaps you'll read a literary, um, a published literary journal or whatnot. And it really sounds like there's a lot of human connection and talking to people involved in that process. Yeah, yeah, I think it needs to be, informed by yeah like not just website and thinking but like thinking about um and so for me I had to kind of I was thinking my one mentor I spent you know several years being around and then I thought about and again the problem was baby you know it's it, there is a slight generational men would be about in her mid 50s mid to late 50s that's not exactly baby boomer anymore so a friend of mine in high school's mother they were Vietnamese had come over it was a little more distant than I would like but but yeah absolutely yeah, and also you talked about pre-writing and writing, and I was wondering if you could um, explain the difference that happens between those two. Yeah, I mean, the, for me now, it's um, I won't have time till the winter break to really actually put my fingers on the keys and do it as much, but I'm really enjoying not having my screen on late at night and just like really just doing a lot of my thinking on paper. I love the pre-writing phase because I really, I love the generative kind of connections and like different possibilities. Um, but that can go on for a while, just thinking about what's the character like, who, who are they, where do they work? Like, what are their, you know, yearnings? What are their losses? You know, all of that stuff. Um, and then because the link fiction is really intricate and fun, it's like, oh, how do they connect? Oh, do they, you know, like, does this one and that one actually talk on the porch? And then that sort of connects with the other one's story. So there's a lot of fun in, in the pre-writing. You keep a notepad to keep track of all these connections and like details that you make. Yeah, I have a um, 
I mean, I have binder clipped notes for each of the stories. And then I have a um, like a cheap sort of journal. My niece put stickers all over um, for, for kind of keeping track of all of them. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And so at the end of um, Miracle Supply Company, um, it's, it's so beautiful. There's this moment of like, you know, hope and she's quit her job. And, um, you know, I think a lot of readers are so satisfied with, with what happens and just they feel um, happy for her. And just you, of course, you don't have to answer this because I know it ties into other stories that you might want to share um, elsewhere. But if you wanted to, um, can you give us a teaser into what happens to Min after she quits her job? Yes. I, um, I do want to leave her on the, you know, I want to leave her on the porch. Like, I feel like it's such a triumph to have that space, right? And, and to not know. It's because it's so scary. They've made us so terrified here, you know, and I think you folks have healthcare. I hope you still do. I hope you're fighting for it. The English need, I mean, the British need to fight for it uh, too. They're getting, but anyway, here we don't have healthcare. So it's like a big deal for her to just, just, you know, and so I want her to be there as long as possible, like with no job or whatever. But, um, you know, she was thinking about the gardening shop. I will, I will say that is one of, she was thinking about that gardening shop. So may, maybe she'll end up there among the plants. That's awesome. Yeah. Her absolute passion and her love. And what is one writing tip that you learned while writing Miracle Supply Company? What I found over and over is whatever wants to be written gets written. <laughs> so I had another thing I was planning to write first and then, but men wanted to be written next. So it's it sort of, I was all kind of oriented and then it was like, no, we're going to do that. So I've learned to just go with what wants to, to whatever really wants to be written gets to come next. The other one, and this is to encourage people to have writing partners and writing friends, is um, because of just my concerns about the piece, I, um, and I've been in a period of just, I don't have a lot of time or even to set up time with friends. So I've just been writing what I write and that's that. But I had hooked up with an old MFA friend of mine and it's just so fun. It's like my brother, the person just feels like my brother. So um, he read it and, and this is Part of the reason to have writing friends is that, you know, if I only get to write every other Saturday night a little bit, not very much, he saw immediately that the first paragraph, like he just was like, start at this paragraph. And it was like, yeah, just start in the Oaks. And I would have found it, I'm sure, you know, like it, you reach a point you can edit yourself well, but it's like, it would have taken me much longer. And he had just fresh eyes. So I think, you know, and, and so get yourself a writing friend because it's just a delight. It's actually a delight. And the thing too, is you'll write more because you'll show up for your friend. You're, you're going to come to that monthly thing, that monthly cup of coffee. Um, so that would just be something. Yeah, that's, that's really beautiful. And I think that um, what you're saying kind of shows that writing can also be a very relational experience, exchanging with another writing partner. And like you said, um, I guess inviting them into this story that you've written and hearing um, or seeing the story through their eyes as well. And also your point about just writing what comes, it reminded me of something that I heard. I think it was from Stephen King. And, you know, this is, um, it's not like the golden rule or whatever. It's just kind of interesting to think about how every writer has a unique process. Um, but I think he was, I think he's similar to you where he just writes, you know, whatever, comes whereas many other authors have said that oh you should know what your last paragraph is going to be like what your last word is going to be like you got to know where the end point is like um and like yeah I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about that and about yeah the reading process this is this is good to, yeah because the usually I'll know my first sentence that was the other thing this was one where I didn't as much so when my friend said do that you know like that's the first paragraph. I was like, it is. Cause it, I didn't really have a first sentence that felt like this is the first. And the end sentence I often will pretty early in I'll, that will come. And it's very clear. Like I, it's like a bell. I mean, it's really like, that's the last sentence. So, um, so that has been helpful for me that, that sort of end point that the rest sort of just does what it wants. But, but that last sentence often is sort of a North star that I'm not fixated on. It's just sort of there. So that's interesting, yeah. As a yeah. guide, so yeah. absolutely. And just as we um, bring our conversation to a close, I'd love to ask what advice you have to young aspiring writers who you know, perhaps have really big ideas, but doubt, experiences doubt that they can really pull through. I love this. And this will circle back, which is always nice. So that idea, which you 
you hit on because you were saying play would that make it easy you know the part that gets all picky at us that was some of my advice at the end was just this idea that by so if we make it play that would be one thing to just consider if it helps you to think of it as work do do that forever do that till you go to your grave you know but but maybe making it a little more playful will reduce some of that doubt you know this kind of if we want to call it doubt I think writing, writers, we do doubt our writing. You know, we write, we doubt ourselves while we're doing it. We doubt ourselves, you know, I mean, before we're doing it, if it's rejected, we doubt ourselves, you know, and, and then we hear good stories. Marlon James, it's right, Booker Prize winner, 80 times the manuscripts rejected. So, so I would say that also to people starting out, that that's okay. You'll get lots of rejections. It doesn't, it doesn't affect the um, quality of what you're doing. I also think we could look at doubt differently. Like one of my meditation teachers, again, something worthwhile to do, challenging to do and our society doesn't care about. So another one of those places um, that looking at doubt, just like it's always gonna be there. It will always be, you know, it's just, just accepting it will always be part of this thing. And so then it becomes for me more like a dog, like some old dog, you know, that shows up and then I'm like, oh, it's you again. Okay, cool. You know, you can come along, you can watch me write. Like, you know, you know we're sort of more at peace and then the last thing related to that, I would say, is just like loving the process of writing. Is and, and I know we talk about it, but I really, I really, really mean it. Like just sort of not knowing, like loving not knowing, loving not having the skills yet, loving pushing the skills in your ideas, and um, loving the tinkering. Like just, just that part of it, and just letting that that then comes right back around to play, right? Because you're just really in it, and then it kind of takes care of itself. Right. Well, thank you so, so much for sharing your heart and your story with us. Um, I'm super excited for people to listen to this because I think that, yeah, you just had a lot of um, really great advice. Thank you. And I want to thank you guys because it, your magazine has, it's beautiful. I mean, really, the, the cover of the first issue was so beautiful. And then, mm -hmm. um, and it's just been really intentional and beautiful working with you guys. You, you're so thoughtful and this is thoughtful. So, and you're doing stuff to kind of get people thinking about craft and writing and the process. So thank you, It's it's been really lovely.